I talk about Toronto a lot on this channel, and some people find it kind of funny. But I still think warts, one of the biggest highways in North America, and all, Toronto is undeniably the North American city growing and changing the most today. And honestly, it's been that way for some time, maybe even a decade or more. You often hear about cities like Austin and Phoenix when it comes to urban growth in North America, not really Toronto. But Toronto is growing up. The city is building comparable numbers of high rises to say New York City, despite being a much smaller urban area. But while that's cool, what's much cooler is that the Toronto region is actually without a doubt the transit construction capital of North America, with more projects going on than any other city, and arguably one of the largest transit expansion programs in the world, not just speaking about North America. But I realized recently I haven't made a single video that in a short span of time gets all of these projects out. So let's look at what they are. Toronto is doing a ton of different stuff, and like the title suggests, I want to try to get all of the stuff Toronto is doing out in a pretty quick period of time, so we don't have much time to waste. Let's start with the subway. Now, the subway in Toronto isn't that iconic. I remember actually living in Toronto when I was a kid, and not even remembering the subway at all. I did remember the streetcars, of course, though. So I do think that there's a sense generally that people underappreciate the Toronto subway, especially relative to the streetcars, even though the subway moves far more people. And as it turns out, the two most important lines on the Toronto subway, lines one and two, which are kind of also the only major notable lines on the subway, the others being pretty short, are getting major upgrades and expansions right now. At the moment, line one of the Toronto subway is being enhanced with communications-based train control, digital signaling, and that's already almost complete across the entire line. Now, this high-tech signaling will allow for higher frequencies and trains only seconds apart, which is amazing. But what goes really underappreciated is that it will also reduce maintenance costs, be way more energy efficient, and also just help make the system more resilient. It's also the building block that we need to do something like platform screen doors in the future, which is really exciting. Now line two is also moving through the early phases of being upgraded with CBTC. Construction hasn't started yet, but it probably will in the next couple of years. This is absolutely huge for line two, which by itself already has more ridership than most rapid transit systems in North America. And with these upgrades, we'll be able to provide not only more frequent service, but much higher capacity, which will be critical as it's Toronto's main high capacity cross town line. And in the future, it's going to be connected at both ends to super high capacity BRT systems. Talk about that a bit later. Now this is also important because Line 2 is getting extended roughly seven kilometers east-northeast as part of the Scarborough subway extension project. This project will extend the line three stops and will add a station at Shepherd and McCowan, Lawrence and McCowan, as well as Scarborough Center Station, which is a major hub for densification, but also for local bus service. Now I think the scale of this expansion is just totally unrecognized by a lot of people, probably because it's something that's been debated and gone back and forth around for a long time, but also because it just started really quickly quite recently. The project is massive, not only because it is using a massive single bore tunnel, but also because it's seven kilometers long, which is actually longer than the original section of the Toronto subway, as some smart observers have pointed out, from Union all the way up to Eglinton. Kind of cool. Now, as it turns out, this line to extension is part of the motivation for installation of CBTC on the line. You see the upgrade of line one with CBTC also was sort of inspired by the extension of the line up to York University and beyond, which actually opened using the new signaling system. The same could quite possibly also be true with line two, with new signaling going live on the extension before it goes live on the rest of the line. That being said, this also presents a bit of a problem because the current trains on line two are not compatible with CBTC. So a brand new large fleet of what will likely be some of the most modern subway trains in North America is currently being procured to serve line two as well as provide some additional trains to line one to help improve frequency past every three minutes with the new CBTC signaling system. This will give Toronto one of the youngest subway fleets in North America and honestly in the world. At the same time, Line 1 is also being extended up north to Richmond Hill, with around 8 kilometers of new track and at least 5 new stations, which is really exciting. The extension will also include a number of bus terminals and an interchange with the Richmond Hill commuter rail line, as well as a new light maintenance and storage yard. Now, sadly, today the Toronto subway isn't fully accessible, like a lot of systems in North America and older systems around the world. But fortunately, that's changing. In the next couple of years, the Toronto subway will be entirely step-free accessible, and the two biggest stations which are blocking that accessibility right now will get major rebuilds, those being Islington and Warden, which will both go from their current weird kind of 
uh, bus lane style terminal into a new modern loop style bus terminal. The massive Bloor Young Interchange Station, which is one of the busiest stations in the continent and the busiest station in Canada, is also getting a massive upgrade. There will be massive new smoke and fire safety systems added, a massive expansion to the Line 1 platforms and concourse level, and a brand new eastbound Line 2 platform that will be served with tons of escalators. The existing Line 2 platform will be converted from an island to a westbound platform and lots more escalators and stairs will also be added to it. The station overall will be way nicer once this renovation is complete and will probably be worthy of its title as the busiest station in Canada. Of course, there's also the brand new Ontario line, which pre-construction has already started for. This will be Toronto's third high capacity downtown subway line and it's super exciting. There'll be 15 new stops over around 15 kilometers of track and the line is set to integrate better with regional rail than we've seen in the past with subway lines. That's because both of the major regional rail interchanges will happen at surface stations, allowing people to go up one level, across and down one level to switch between regional rail and subway services. The line will also upgrade three existing subway stations to become interchanges, Queen, Osgood, and Pape. And probably the most exciting element for me is that it's going to be the most modern urban subway in North America, with platform screen doors, full automation, and overhead line power. Now, I mentioned the streetcars before, and as you can probably mention, things are getting better over there as well. The city already has a low floor, fully accessible, high capacity streetcar fleet across the entire network with 200 vehicles, but 60 more have recently been ordered to massively expand the fleet. That will offer more frequency on some of the existing services, but also some new services, in particular across Toronto's developing harbour front in the next 10 years or so. At the same time, the highly successful King Street Priority Project, which basically removed through car traffic on Toronto's downtown King Street, will be made permanent, which will mean the streetscaping will be much nicer on one of Toronto's most important streetcar routes. Not necessarily related to transit, but I also think it's worth mentioning that Young Street, the location of Toronto's original and busiest subway, is also seeing a complete transformation in the next few years through the downtown over the core sections of the Toronto subway. That will see less car lanes and much wider sidewalks, which is super exciting. Now, speaking of streetcars, let's talk about LRT, which Toronto people will hate if you compare to streetcars, but which is really just a modern interpretation of the streetcars that we already see on Spadina and St. Clair. That said, I don't love the term streetcar, so I'll refer to these lines as trams. In the next two years, two new tram lines will open in Toronto, known as Line 5 on Eglinton and Line 6 on Finch Avenue. Now, the total track length of these two lines will be 30 kilometers. There will be 13 new enclosed station facilities added and a total of 26 new surface level tram stops. And these tram stops are a lot nicer than you see with the existing streetcar network. They'll have full level boarding, they'll be larger, they'll have better weather protection, they'll have off-board fare payment, they'll have next train screens, and they'll also have audio announcements. Really nice. Some of the network also has green track, which I think is just a great feature that I'd like to see get rolled out much more widely in the city. Now the entire Finch line and the Eglinton line east of Laird Station are actually operating as surface tramways, and the Eglinton line from Laird Station west operates essentially like a subway. Peak frequencies will be every three to four minutes from opening day and will only get better with time. The Eglinton line is also really exciting because it adds three new subway interchanges at Kennedy, Cedarvale, also known as Eglinton West right now, and Eglinton Station, and three new regional rail interchanges, also at Kennedy, at Caledonia, and at Mount Dennis. As it turns out, a western extension of Line 5 is already under construction with tunnel boring machines in the ground right now, and that will take the line all the way west to the eastern end of the Mississauga Transitway, a stone's throw from Pearson International Airport where the line will be extended probably in the next 10 years or so. In the year or two after that, another 19 kilometer tramway will open in the region, in Peel, connecting Mississauga and Brampton, as well as two major rail lines, two major bus hubs, and the Mississauga Transitway. A few years after that, a new 14 km tramway will open in Hamilton, which will connect people with walking connections to West Harbour GO Station, where they can travel to Toronto on regular trains that should run as often as every 30 minutes. There are also three extensions of current or under construction tram corridors that are seriously being discussed and are likely to at least begin construction in the next 10 years. Those include the Waterloo Ion extension down to Cambridge, the Toronto Line 6 extension west to the Woodbine Transit Hub, and the extension of the Huron Terror Line in Peel Region all the way to downtown Brampton to connect with the rail station there. Now, I actually think that despite all of this rail expansion happening, buses are still incredibly important for Toronto's transit system, and possibly the most important part. And so it's exciting to know that things are improving a lot with bus transit in the city as well. The first big thing is that electric buses are becoming much more widely deployed. 
Not only is riding on electric bus way more comfortable, but they also pollute far less than diesel buses. Electric buses are being tested by basically every transit agency in the region right now, and Toronto's TTC is committing to them in a big way. They already have the largest fleet in North America of battery electric buses at 60 and have ordered 300 more to augment the fleet which will mean that once they're all delivered, battery electric buses will make up over 10% of the bus fleet in Toronto. And Toronto's buses get serious use, so these buses won't just be sitting in a yard, they'll be operating frequent services every 10 minutes or so across the city. As it turns out, even Go Transit is testing electric double-decker buses for its express bus routes, which is super cool. Toronto's local buses are also just getting better. They're slowly rolling out Wi-Fi. A lot of them already have digital LCD wayfinding, which is finally getting nicer designs, and new accessible stops are being rolled out at key interchange points on the bus network, allowing for better accessibility, but also just better comfort for all passengers. There's also the expansion of the dedicated bus lane program, which we've seen already on Eglinton Avenue East, and will also likely expand to other parts of the suburbs in the coming years. Speaking regionally, there are also two massive new BRT corridors being built across the region. The first is the Dundas BRT, which is extending west from the new Kipling bus hub at the western end of Line 2 all the way to Hamilton, roughly 50 kilometers, with 20 kilometers of that being dedicated bus lanes. There will also be a connection between this BRT and the Huron Ontario tram line, which is really exciting. There will also be a new eastern BRT line built from Scarborough Centre Station on the new Line 2 subway extension all the way east to Durham, roughly 40 kilometers. That line will actually mostly be in dedicated bus lanes. With all of this BRT and along with the existing Viva and Mississauga transitway systems, I think Toronto has a good chance at being North America's BRT capital once the current program of works is complete. And of course, if you've watched this channel for any serious period of time, you'll know there's a lot of other mainline rail expansion happening here in Toronto. Now, there is the regional rail system, but it's also worth mentioning that the intercity trains that regularly serve Toronto, namely via rail, will actually be getting a lot better in coming years. Not only is there the potential for a new high frequency or high speed rail project which will connect Toronto with Ottawa, Quebec City and Montreal, but at the very least Toronto is definitely going to be served by the very nice new Siemens charger sets that VIA has already started taking delivery of. On the regional rail side of things, Toronto has the biggest and honestly the only comprehensive plan for electrified citywide high frequency regional rail right now in North America. A lot of projects are happening to help support that, including grade separations all over the place, additional track, whether it be quad track, double track or the like, and enhanced station facilities. Way more than I can get into into this single video, but which I've covered in a lot of previous videos. You can check out expansions of stations like Asian Court and Rutherford in other videos. The cool thing is that since electrification is finally moving forward in Toronto, we will not only be able to have electrical locomotives, which will pull our quite nice and honestly in really good condition existing Bombardier bi-level fleet, but that will also enable future electrical multiple units when capacity and service warrant it, which I actually think is going to be a lot sooner than later. At the same time, as I've discussed in previous videos, Toronto is getting five new major urban regional rail stations, two of which will be major hubs, those being at East Harbour, where you'll be able to connect between the Ontario Line, Lakeshore East and Stovall Line, and King Liberty, where you'll be able to connect between the Kitchener Line, hopefully the Barrie Line, and to Exhibition Station about a 10 minute walk away. At Exhibition, we're also getting a major new regional rail hub, with four dedicated platforms for the various GO services operating on the Lakeshore West, as well as separate services from the Ontario line, as well as streetcar and bus services. Quite the nice hub. Developers are also helping to fund some major new stations. Park Lawn Station will help finally deliver high-frequency rapid transit service to the incredibly dense Humber Bayshores neighborhood. And Woodbine Station on the Kitchener Line will add a major new transit hub in the Pearson Employment Zone that will serve the Up Express as well as GO trains and potentially Line 6. Five of Toronto's regional rail lines, and six services if you want to talk about it in a pedantic way since there is the Airport Express, will receive high-frequency all-day electrified rail service. And all of these corridors already have some degree of all-day service, with a bunch of them already up to every 30 minutes or even better. All-day 15-minute service is likely to be coming back to three of the lines in the next couple of months. At the same time, two of the lines which are currently operating hourly midday frequencies, the Kitchener and Stovall lines, will likely get upgraded to every 30 minutes in the next couple of months as well, as new quad track and double track goes in along these lines. Now, the Barry Line, which is the last of the electrified regional rail corridors, is moving a bit slower than the others, with hourly service right now. That'll likely get improved once the Davenport Diamond Project, a massive new grade separation in central Toronto, is complete. So stay tuned for that. 
At the same time, there are massive transit-oriented developments going on at a variety of stations, from Main Street Danforth to Mimico. So I think we can expect a lot more people living and working near GO stations, which will drive ridership. Speaking of ridership, weekend ridership, which is actually pretty respectable, has already recovered entirely from COVID. And I expect weekday ridership could recover by, say, the end of the year. And it will probably surpass previous ridership given the higher service levels that we'll be seeing. Of course, GO is also getting extended as well. There's a major planned extension of the Lakeshore East Line into Bowmanville, which will add four new stations and will actually receive all-day regular service, something we don't see nearly enough of here in North America. And so, yeah, Toronto already feels unrecognizable in its urban form from 10 years ago. But in 10 years from now, its public transit will also feel unrecognizable. And that has me really excited. Thanks for watching.